Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this installment of the K Perpetua Speaker Series. Uh, today, we'll be hearing from Andrea Sharp. Oh, and Andrea, looks like I forgot to fix the spelling of your name here, too. It's only one F, just for those who ever do an internet <laughs> search on her. Uh, but she's going to be talking to us about saving Big Creek and saving the Oregon Silver Spot Butterfly. Um, and next Saturday, we'll be hearing from Matthew Riley, who will be sharing on climate change, disturbance, and forest change in the Oregon Coast Range. I like to uh, do a land acknowledgement uh, that the Cape Perpetua area landscape from Yahats to Florence is the tra traditional territory of the Siletz tribe and the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayuslaw tribe, and want to acknowledge that the tribal governments and their roles historically and today in taking care of these lands. A little bit about the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. My name is Tara Dubois. I'm the communications coordinator for the Collaborative, and it's a pleasure to organize this series. Um, and the Collaborative's vision is to foster conservation and collaboration within local communities for scientific exchange, management, awareness, and stewardship from the land to the sea in and around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And our three guiding principles are community engagement, leveraging resources, and engaging in partnerships. And you can see a variety of logos here at the bottom. Um, these are our founding partners. Um, and we also have a variety of business and local partners um, as well that are not listed here, uh, but we do love to share um, and work and collaborate with all of our partners. It's not possible without all of us working together. Um, and our focus is on the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. Uh, the Marine Reserve, in addition to its protected areas, have some form of protected waters that stretch from Yahats to Florence. And you can see these many gorgeous views that you can get along that stretch. Um, and if you want to learn more about the Marine Reserve and the science that takes place within it, uh, you can head on over to our website. Um, at kperpetualcollaborative.org and you can get more information there. We also host quite a few community science projects at Cape Perpetua. Um, you can see here, there's a variety of them. Many are seasonal, uh, but we do monthly beach cleanups uh, throughout the whole year. Um, we're also hosting a Young Scientist webinar series on the second Tuesday of the month, October through April, where we host a grad student or a postdoc um, and learn about their ocean research. And upcoming next week on November 18th, we've got our Land Sea Symposium, and we have got a great lineup for that event. Um, and so again, if you're curious to learn any more about these projects or our speakers or events, uh, head on over to our website, kperpetualcollaborative.org. If you click on the events tab, that'll take you to the calendar with a listing of all of everything coming up. And do connect with us on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Um, and if you feel inclined um, and want to support the work, you can donate. Uh, and that there is a donate button on our website as well. It keeps it very simple. And with that, I'd like to introduce our author, uh, uh, our speaker today, Andrea Sharp. She's the author of Saving Big Creek. Uh, she has been writing since she was 10. She has an MFA in creative writing from Vermont College of Fine Arts and has published short stories and articles on subjects ranging from the nutritional impact of dead salmon to the financial impact of a Collier's strike. She has worked as a teacher, co-founder, and manager of the Portland Saturday Market, small business entrepreneur, city planner, marketing director, and association manager, among other positions. Whether hiking in the Cascades or the Coast Range, exploring tide pools or an urban park, she is always attracted to the natural world. Since moving to the Oregon coast, she has been active in protecting that world as a founder and former chair of View the Future, a nonprofit environmental advocacy organization. And with that, Andrea, I'm gonna let you take it over. And as Andrea is pulling up her screen, I just wanna let the audience know that you are welcome to input questions into the chat or the Q&A. Um, throughout the presentation. And at the end, we'll go through those and do a Q&A session and get those answered. All right, enjoy. Good luck, Andrea. <laughs> Thank you. Whoops, go back. How did I do that? Okay, 
Um, thank you, Tara. Um, I'm very excited to be here. And I'm very excited to have a wonderful audience out there. Good morning, everybody. I can't see you, but I know you're there. And that's very encouraging. It's, I think this whole program is, is exciting and everything that the collaborative is doing is very worthwhile and exciting. So the first slide is a picture of Big Creek, which flows into the ocean about halfway between Yahats and Florence. Uh, this is a view looking south. That's the Big Creek Bridge. And it flows, it takes this funny little jog and then flows into the ocean on your right. And on the left, it goes back up into a valley, um, which gradually narrows. And there, there's about 186 acres that was privately owned. Um, the land, most of the land around there is either National Forest Service, the Sayusla National Forest, or state parks and campgrounds to the north and south. And of course, the beach, which is absolutely marvelous in this area, just this wonderful long run of um, salt spray meadows, which we're going to talk about, and, and ocean. And, and a lot of times you can walk along there and there's absolutely no one around. And I think, it, I think I'd like to talk just a little bit about what this area might have looked like if in the Big Creek campaign, the campaign to keep it from being turned into a resort, um, hadn't succeeded. Um, the whole area off your screen to the left would have been um, covered with buildings. There would have been hotels, um, a, a restaurant, a convention center, um, condos, and eventually probably houses as well. And of course, none of that exists. So it is all still in its very natural condition, which isn't to say it's undisturbed. Uh, there have been homesteaders in the area, people who settled here, uh, people who farmed a little bit, it's not great farming, but tried, and mostly ran cattle, um, especially through this wetlands area and up and down the coast in the salt meadows, um, which is, you will see, going to cause some problems when we talk about the butterfly. In 1979, a man named Vic Renahan and his wife and another couple purchased this property for $286,000. With the intent, he said, of building a rustic resort, a couple of cabins, and maybe a little trading post, and a couple of houses for he, himself and the other couple to live in and when they retired so they could manage this resort. Um, as, as we'll talk about eventually, the, the um, concept grew and grew until eventually it was a destination resort with three hotels and, as I said, these condos, and eventually there would have been residences too, because that's how you make money when you build a destination resort. You don't make money from the resort. You make it from selling property for people to build second homes or first homes. So the, the people who organized to try to stop this resort were all almost all local people. They lived up Big Creek Road. They lived up Yahats River Road, 10 Mile Creek Road some in Florence, some in Eugene, some in Yahats itself. Um, and they took this project on and, and began working on it in 1980 because uh, the developer needed a zone change in order to build his resort. And that was the initial point of contact. Um, this went uh, for <laughs> a long time. So 1980 was the first zone change hearing. In 2008, the Nature Conservancy finally bought it. And in 2013, finally, it was transferred to Oregon State Parks to be kept undeveloped in perpetuity. The only development that might occur is a trail that would connect the, the Rock Creek Campground on the north end to the Washburn State Park Campground at the south end. Um, but nothing else, no buildings, no campgrounds, nothing. I moved to Yahats in 1994, and at that point, the, the effort to save Big Creek to prevent the resort from being built was only a little over halfway, a little under halfway accomplished. Of course, nobody knew that, but they all stuck with it. And the subtitle of my book is How a Persistent Group of Activists Blocked a Multi-Million Dollar Resort, Rescued an Endangered Butterfly, and Expanded Opportunities for Citizen Involvement in Land Use Decisions in Oregon which quite, is quite a lot for just a handful of people, but they stuck with this for a very long time. And 
probably the last 15 years, there were two major efforts. One was um, Jim Adler and Tom Smith working to make sure that every time the developer tried to do something, they were on top of it and were able to object or block it in some way. Uh, the other prong was finding the money to buy him out. And to that end, Paul Engelmeyer, who is the Audubon representative on the coast, um, was extremely active. And when a man was hired by the Nature Conservancy, a man named Derek Johnson, um, I, it was somewhere around 205, 2005, 2006, um, Paul immediately contacted Derek and said, you got to come down here. You got to see Big Creek. It's a gorgeous place. You need to know it's here. And so things were kind of set in place. Uh, there was a lot of effort to, to find the money. But finally, the developer called Paul one morning. And I'd like to read just two pages from the book that indicates what happened. The Dunes Cafe in Florence was next to a laundromat at one end of a strip mall on the corner of Highway 101 and Highway 126. Paul Engelmeyer got a cup of coffee and sat down. Vic Renahan came in a few minutes later. They chatted briefly, establishing their positions, assessing each other. Finally, Paul told Vic he was here to do a deal. We're committed to protection and restoration at Big Creek, he said. We can find the money. Renahan said he, his corporation, had put a lot into the property. There were some terrific sites for two homes with great views of the ocean and the Big Creek estuary. They were filing a Measure 37 claim, which would allow them to subdivide the property into 15 10 acre parcels. It's not going to happen, Vic. Is your defense guy still on it? Renahan asked. He was referring to Jim Adler, who had kept Vic's every move on his radar. Filling his, filing the appropriate objections with the Lane County Planning Department. He is, Paul. Paul took a sip of his coffee and put the cup down firmly. Listen, Vic, your development is never going to happen. The opposition isn't going away. U.S. Fish and Wildlife has plans in place for habitat restoration for the silver spot butterfly. They don't want to see these efforts compromised with a big resort and houses all over the place. Excuse me. <clears throat> The Department of Fish and Wildlife doesn't want any new fishing pressure on the native fish in the creek. Plus, they're committed to maintaining elk habitat. All these agencies want to put management strategies into place to restore and preserve habitat. And we're on top of any land use moves you make. We're willing to work with you, but we need to know you're serious. How will you find the money? Not a problem, Paul said. He had been successfully putting deals together to preserve land in the coast range. Now he unrolled his maps across the Formica table. This is where people who know Paul well laugh because that's what he always does. I've been doing land purchase agreements with the Forest Service, with Audubon, with state parks. Here, he said, pointing to the map, and here, and here. I don't want to work with the Forest Service, Renahan said. They're corrupt and they won't pay me what that property is worth. I could sell it, you know, somebody wanting to put in a world-class resort. Vic, look. The economy is slowing down. Did anyone make an offer on the property? You've had it listed for what, five years? Did you get even one offer? Even Salisham is struggling. I want 4.1 million. It's worth it, all we put into it. Patiently, Paul outlined the next steps. An appraisal had to be done, and the price would depend on that. Listen, Vic, the Nature Conservancy is interested in Big Creek. It's exactly the kind of project they would support but I need to know you're serious. I need to go to them with a willing seller. You can't back away from this again. Vic liked the idea of the Nature Conservancy. He thought they would be able to act faster than any government agency and could write him a check without a lot of time consuming paperwork. He said he would take Paul's offer back to his corporation. Paul rolled up his maps. Vic put some money on the table for their coffee. They shook hands. Paul went home and called Derek Johnson. So it didn't all just happen just like that. <laughs> as much as Mr. Renahan would have liked it, he got, he got his purchase money, but then the Nature Conservancy had to raise the money to pay back their re revolving fund. And as you saw from that timetable, 2008, we had a little real estate meltdown and um, that slowed everything down, which is why it was 2013. 
before they finally were able to um, finish it and, and sign it off to state parks. And just to give you a real time perspective, <clears throat> 100 million years ago, there was no Oregon coast. This whole area was underwater. There was a, a warm tropical sea that stretched all the way to Idaho. So if you wanted a tropical beach vacation, you had to go to Idaho. OK, here is the silver spot. About two inches in size. It's um, a pretty little thing. It's brown with these silver spots on its underwings. And when the sun catches it, it, it flashes and looks very silvery. And it's very pretty. At this point, time was really running out for the silver spot. There were very few left. They used to have, occupy sites from Long Beach Peninsula in the north all the way south to Del Norte County in California. But at this point in the early two, well, in 1980, when it was listed as endangered, um, there were hardly any left. I mean, hardly any. At one point, uh, when the, the system was in place to capture um, females and bring them to the Oregon Zoo, which we're going to talk about eventually, um, they found one in Del Norte County, one one butterfly. And they pr brought it back to the Oregon Zoo and everybody stood around watching it, hoping that it would be gravid with eggs that is pregnant and ready to lay some eggs, but it wasn't. So that was the end, that was the end. There were other places, the Big Creek uh, Meadows were, um, I think they found one, one year. I mean, they were very close to extermination. So I went to this celebration in 2013 in September. And all of a sudden there were all the people that I had heard about through my friends who had been working on this project. And I was very excited to see these people and very struck with the fact that these folks who had started out in 1980 as young, enthusiastic people were in their twenties then and thirties. And now they're in their sixties and seventies. And I thought, boy, Tell the story now. This is this is important, and that's when I started um, interviewing people and doing the research to write the book. The goals for for saving Big Creek and the reason these agencies got involved and so many people got interested in it was not only because of the butterfly, but it was kind of a totem animal, and people were very excited um, about trying to save it because it was on the endangered species list the same year that Mr. Renahan uh, purchased the property. So. The, the, the rationale and the reasons for protecting Big Creek were first of all, to protect critical habitat. Secondly, was to put it in public ownership so that there would now be access. Um, you can walk up the road, it's, it's very pretty. It's a sweet area. It's beautiful in different, every different season of the year. There are big old twisted spruce trees on one side and big um, fir trees on the other side of the estuary. And it's, it's really a lovely area, even without a whole lot of trails in it, it's very pretty. Um, so the public access is guaranteed. And the, pardon me, the scenic values and the consistence with surroundings was the other important value because there is no development in this area. There's some campgrounds that you can barely even see from the road and there's no gas stations, there's no gift shops, there's, um, until you get all the way down to Hasita Head and, and the, um, the sea lion caves and the lighthouse and so on. But it's, it's quite empty and, and quite undeveloped and having a big resort there would have made a huge change. So there are three key animals that I already mentioned in, in the area um, that need this habitat. One is elk. The elk roam through the property. Usually they go into the ocean to wash off the parasites and they wander through. Um, because it's now a state park, there's no hunting in the area. So that does benefit them. There was also some concern that if there were a resort there, there'd be some adverse interactions between the elk and the guests and somebody might get hurt. I'm not sure that would have happened, but it was, it was a good argument. Big Creek has a native run of wild salmon. There's no hatcheries fish there. There's also trout. And it, it, there was a lot of concern that um, a resort would, would create ex excess fishing pressure on it because the people at the resort would want to go and fish. And it's very easy to catch a coho salmon smolt in the thinking that it is a trout. Um, so that would further pressure a very um, threatened 
species. And finally, there was the OHB, the Oregon silver spot but butterfly. And as I said, this one was seriously in danger at this point. Um, they use the site in different ways. They, the eggs are laid on the salt spray meadows, which are very um, peculiar and specific environment, which has been lost to development and housing and human activity. Um, because they're buffeted by salt winds or winds over the ocean that bring a lot of salt in, the vegetation is very sparse and very specific. And the butterflies hatch their eggs there and the eggs turn into caterpillars. And after they hatch, they fly over to the east side of the highway um, where they're out of the wind and can find mates and do that thing. And then they come back over to lay their eggs. So it's, it's pretty critical habitat for them, which would have been compromised by the resort. And all of the efforts to try and recover the butterfly would also have been compromised by the resort. When I was doing my research and reading the um, information and the reports that got, helped to get the butterfly listed with the Environmental Protection Agency, this was the chilling word that I just hated, extirpated. It just is just ugly. <laughs> and it just means done, totally destroyed, exterminated, wiped out, abolished, ain't no more. And the butterfly was very, very close to being extirpated in quite a number of sites. It was, it has just simply disappeared and nobody knows if it ever will come back. Silver spot recovery focused on two things. One was the habitat restoration and the other is captive rearing and release. This is the key player in the recovery campaign. It's a small little plant called the viola adunca or blue violet. And it grows in this specific area on the salt spray meadows. And it's critical because the leaves of the viola adunca are the only thing the caterpillar eats after it, um, after it hatches from its egg uh, and after it goes into its um, dormancy during the winter, which the violet also does. Both of them come out in the spring, caterpillars are hungry and the violets provide food. So it's their leaves. And if there aren't any violets, there aren't any caterpillars and then there aren't any butterflies. So restoring the habitat was really important. And it had been decimated for a number of reasons. First of all, there's a lot of invasive species that have grown there and that outcompete all the native plants. Um, there's some cases where the indigenous people burned these areas for various reasons, and that helped keep the um, invading vegetation or the competing vegetation down. Um, but over time, the, the, the new settlers had um, generally used this area for grazing cattle and horses. And um, if any of you know the area well, Stonefield Beach is named for the Stonefield Brothers. One lived at the mouth of Ten Mile Creek and the other lived at the mouth of Big Creek. And they ran cattle up and down the coast. And the cattle grazing did take away some of the competing vegetation, but also the seeds that were dropped ended up growing grasses and forbs that again outcompeted the violets. Another problem is that um, elk would browse the area too. And um, that kept trees from sort of spreading. Trees like to move into an open area and fill it in. And so um, the elk were no longer browsing down there as much as they had, maybe because of crossing uh, the highway. And so little trees began to grow up and basically the environment was bad. So there are a couple of things you could do. One technique is mowing, mowing down the competing vegetation. Another is controlled burning. Herbicides are used. Again, here's a little tree that we don't want to have there because they eventually grow up and shade the area and change the whole uh, area. Uh, so, but that has to be done, of course, very carefully. And finally, there's solarization, which is simply using all that black plastic that you put down on your garden to keep weeds from growing up, um, if you do that sort of thing, to kill the invasive plants. And you, you might have seen a lot of black plastic covering areas of um, the Big Creek, Rock Creek salt spray meadows <clears throat> as you drove down 101. 
Okay, the, this caterpillar, when it emerges from its dormancy, it is super hungry. And again, it's looking to that early blue violet for food. And not only does it need the violet for food, it need plenty of it, but the <laughs> students at Reed College, no, I'm sorry, students Lewis, Lewis and Clark did a study and they put pins in the ground where they watched caterpillars move. And the caterpillars do not wake up and say, yum, there's a violet and go right for it. They kind of wander around this way, that way. And if there aren't a lot of violets, they're not gonna find what they need. And so it's not just having violets there, but it's having enough violets. So another effort at habitat rest restoration is actually growing the violets. And there are a number of places that do it. This is an ODFW nursery. Um, they're also grown, they were grown at OSU for a while. I, and I think that program may still be going. Private people have farms where they grow um, native plants and collect the seeds. And all this is an effort to create violets, which are, are grown in little plugs. And then you get a bunch of volunteers together and they go out and they poke a hole in the ground and they put the plug in and pat around it and hope that the violet will take and grow. Um, this is an area that's been cleared by solarization. And I've planted violets, it's really fun, but I'm always aware that behind me, there are invasive species kind of watching and waiting. And I have the feeling when, when your back is turned, they make a dash for, uh, <laughs> for the area where you planted. Okay, so you get the habitat change and then you need to make more uh, silver spots. So the Woodland Park Zoo in Washington State and the Oregon Zoo in Portland, both have programs for raising captive Oregon silver spots. And I got to visit the one in, Oregon, in Portland and it's quite an operation. It's, um, it's 24 seven, it's constant work. They have, um, at the time they were doing two different butterflies, the Oregon silver spot and the checker spot, which is also um, endangered due to habitat loss. And um, I got to look at the, the, the checker spots because the silver spots were still hibernating and they were in a refrigerator in one of the rooms. Um, after they hatch, they are, they're fed and they grow, they mature, they become butterflies. The males are put in containers where they eat everything, every plant, every flower that's put in there. And then eventually a female carefully hand fed is put in there also. And um, that's how they do it. <laughs> and then there are eggs. And some of the, some of the better butterflies are also released in the field. It's a huge program involving many, many, many partners. I think, as you could tell from what Tara said, all of these projects are the work of many people, many agencies, many organizations all working together and doing different parts of the project. One of the most interesting ones for me is something called, oops, sorry, the Sustainability and Prison Projects. Um, there are inmates in some correctional facilities that are raising violets. Some are raising the plantains that are the food for the checker spots. And the person who was showing me around the, the lab um, told me that she would go up to Washington State to one of the men's prisons and where they were raising violets. And they all knew her. And when she arrived, they all said, hey, how are you doing? How are our babies doing? They're very enthused and very excited about being part of this project. But it was the women's prison that particularly got me because one of them, Coffee Creek Correctional Facility in um, Oregon, actually has trained inmates to raise the butterflies. And here is one of the women um, feeding a, a, a checker spot female. Same thing would be done with the silver spot. You can see it's patient, time consuming, very, very careful work. But what really impressed me was that one of the inmates said that raising the butterflies, raising the caterpillars, turning them into butterflies, for her was like a metaphor for surviving the correctional system and changing her life. And that you make many, many errors, but eventually you emerge as a butterfly. And I really, I really like that image. I have to say, touring this facility, I was in tears half the time because it's, it's such a huge effort and um, 
and people are putting their hearts into it. it, it it's very touching. Here are the violas being raised in prison. This is what the silver spot larva look like. They're very small. Um, when they when they first hatch, they hatch from little eggs. They're about the size of um, a sesame seed, and they're about <laughs> at the beginning. They're about the size of Lincoln's nose on a penny. You can go look at your pennies and see how big they are. They're very little. There are some on violet leaves after they've hatched and gone through their dormancy period. Um, they're about an inch long and it, it's, it's hard to find them. It's hard to protect them. If somebody walks through the um, salt spray meadow it, that you can easily stomp on them. And again, because there aren't very many habitat sites still occupied, uh, the, the partners in recovery have gone to um, looking for other sites. This is one of the sites that they're using, the Nestucca Bay National Wildlife Refuge, north of here, um, where they're finding habitat, planting violets, introducing the caterpillars. Another effort involves training a dog to sniff out um, caterpillar poop. <laughs> which is called FRAS, F-R-A-S-S. -S. I'm dying to use that in a Scrabble game someday. Um, the dogs are training, they wear little booties to keep them from stepping on things. Um, and they can actually sniff through the grass and find uh, the, the larva's poop. And hopefully that means that there are critters there. It's really hard to find them. I mean, you crawling around on your hands and knees, you'd miss a lot. So this is one way of doing it. Okay, finally, we're gonna to get to the tents. Remember the white tents that were visible along 101 on the Salt Spray Meadows between Bray's Point near 10 Mile and south down to Rock Creek and, and 10 Mile Creek. Um, I thought they were a great mystery. I thought we should have a contest to get people's ideas of what were these things, cute little tents. They're about, they have four sides, about four feet long. Obviously they have four sides. And they were um, created and actually made by a woman named um, Erica Henry, who's shown here. She works for uh, US Fish and Wildlife. And this was her project to see if you put, they put seven larvae inside the tent in different habitats, different, different areas that have been treated differently, either growing violets, mowing down the veget competing vegetation, ways to see what it is that makes for a successful hatch. Um, the science of this is new. People are learning stuff all the time. And of course, they're not just learning about butterflies, they're learning about the entire habitat and the ecosystem that they're, that they're working with. So they're trying to determine best management, what's going to work best. Um, they find wild butterflies. They, they are able to mark the butterflies, if you can imagine. Um, they mark them and they can tell which ones are wild ones and which ones are hatchery ones. The wild ones are hatching. There were about 200 um, along this area last summer. The uh, lab raised ones are not, don't seem to be doing as well and, and they want to find out why. So 200 adults hatched along the coast an silver spot on uh, flowers that they, they eat. Their adult diet is not so picky, so they can eat a bunch of different things, thistles and asters and so on. And basically what they do is they eat, they love, and then they pray because the next thing that happens is um, dicey and makes the whole project kind of scary. But before I get to that, I'm going to talk about stream restoration because this was the other big project in the Big Creek area. This is a reference reach upstream from um, the estuary area. And this is the this is way it should look, a free flowing stream with um, irregular borders and curves and logs and stuff. And that's not what there was. This is what there was. <laughs> when I looked at this picture, I thought, oh my gosh, do I have it backwards? Is that the road up at the top? Uh, it's not the road, it is the river. <laughs> And it, got, it was channelized, uh, probably they grazed cattle in the area, so they didn't want flooding uh, 
disrupting the cattle grazing. But this particular area was a gravel storage pit for um, the Oregon Department of Transportation. And um, they leveled it, they took all the vegetation away, they put up a barrier uh, uh, next to the river so that they wouldn't have flooding. And they raised the level of the area to get it out of the floodplain by bringing in fill of all, all types. And so this, there was a huge effort to take care of this. Again, many, many partners. Um, Midcoast Watersheds Council was one of the main uh, partners in this activity, but National Forest, ODFW, um, all of them. In fact, ODOT, ODOT as well, which relocated its gravel storage down near Washburn. This is what they did. They took the gravel pit away. They cut the ground back down to the original uh, cobble from the, from the stream. They brought in large woody debris and also smaller pieces of wood and stuck them into the ground so they wouldn't just get washed back out to the ocean. They had permits to do this and they had monitors to make sure that they were um, being careful with the habitat. They sectioned off an area to, um, to provide a bypass for the fish. And of course they did all this in a, at a time when the fish wouldn't be migrating I thought one of the fun things about this was that um, after they started working, a couple of beavers showed up and built a dam in the river, um, which is a good thing. It also slows down the flow of the river. But I just had this image of little Bucky Beaver with his yellow uh, hard hat and, and his slide rule kind of walking through here and building his little dam. And maybe he was, maybe he was looking at those Tonka trucks and thinking, wow, I wish I had one of those. This is what it looked like at the first high water event which is what it's supposed to look like. The water spread out, um, the, rock, the woody debris held uh, gravel in place and slowed the water flow down, providing much habitat for the fish, both migrating fish and the fish spawning, because you need, they need slow water and gravel to lay their eggs, and also safer habitat for the smolts, the baby salmon, as they rest on their, and, and transition into um, becoming ocean going. Critters. Okay, that was the water project. I'm going to give you some links at the end so you can get some more information about these. Okay, so now we have silver spots. They're adults, they're feeding on the east side of the highway. And life isn't easy. I said eat, love, pray. The prey part is getting across 101. Their migration is late August, early September, height of summer traffic. They fly at just about the level of the windshield of an RV or a truck. And unfortunately, their fates are not happy ones. Obviously, not all of them get killed, but it's it, it, when you're trying to save just a few, you only have a few there, you need to really be careful. And then there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, there's the highway, there's the cars going by. Um, it's not like some areas where you can build a bridge for animals or a tunnel under the road which has been done to preserve some animals. It's, um, excuse me, it, it's, it's sad. And um, I just, you just have to hope they get more and more and more of them hatched so that enough survive to make the population grow again. Okay, what is chaos theory doing here? Well, as I wrote the book, um, two, two butterfly memes, occurred to me. One of them is chaos theory, um, an effect called the butterfly effect. And the butterfly effect says that if a very tiny change happens, such as a butterfly flapping its wings in the South Pacific, it could cause a major change somewhere else in the world, like a hurricane hitting New England. Um, the researcher who first came up with this idea um, came upon it because he was running a program uh, on his computer and he left the room to do something um, and he had made one teeny tiny mistake. And when he came back, the program had gone off into a projection that was totally off base and not at all what he expected. And it was because of this tiny little error. And so he came up with this idea that a tiny little event that seems insignificant can have vast changes. He called it the seagull effect. Fortunately, one of his colleagues said before he made his presentation of his paper, he said, mm, change it to butterfly, which does sound a lot better. And somehow the idea of something so ephemeral and so delicate 
as a butterfly, um, creating such changes is, is more effective. But the problem is we don't know. And the real meaning isn't that if you knew one event you could predict, it's that there are so many events that you can't possibly predict. So you need to be very aware and careful about any one event. Which led me to the second meme, which was a book that I read, or a short story that I read in junior high, it was back in the 50s, called A Sound of Thunder by Ray Bradbury. And it very much involves a butterfly. In this story, a bunch of hunters go on a safari back in time. They're going to kill a Tyrannosaurus rex, which has been picked by the guides because it's an animal that is going to get killed anyway. A tree is about to fall on it. And so it's not going to disrupt anything. The Tyrannosaurus rex appears, and one of the hunters is so freaked out by the size and the sound and the fury of this animal that he staggers and he steps off the little path that they were told never to step off on. They were not to touch anything, not to kill anything. Only the one animal that had been picked out. When they get back to the office of the hunting safari, everything has changed. Um, there had been a presidential election, and the person who was elected was a liberal, a good guy, um, smart, handsome, etc. When they get back, it turns out it was his opponent that got elected, and he's basically a fascist. And this was written just after World War II. But in addition, the colors are muted, sounds are muted, language has devolved into a kind of very simple kind of language and um, and everything is different. Everything is less complex. The hunter who stepped off the path turns over his shoe, looks at the bottom of his boot, and in the mud is a dead fresh butterfly. So the point is you never know what effect you might have. Um, and that to me is a big reason why saving Big Creek was so important and all the other things that we have been doing to preserve the environment. Here are some contacts, um, links to my book, savingbigcreek.com. You can contact me at Gmail. You can buy the book at Mari's Books in Yahats. If you want to learn more about the floodplain restoration project, this is a link um, to the Midcoast Watershed Council's presentation. And on OSB recovery, there's quite a lot. There's a PBS program. I don't have the link for that, but Yahats News wrote an article about the tents and sort of reviewed the whole butterfly um, project. And that is basically the end of my um, presentation. Uh, Tara, I'm sorry to say I don't have um, a clock in front of me, so. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> Here we are. Oh, good, all right, all right. I'll go back Great. and forth between the butterfly and the link, so. Okay, okay. that's it. Very cool. Thank you so much, Andrea. Oh, thank so you. we got our thank first you. question in. When do the okay. larva pupate? They the the eggs are are laid, you know, in soon after the butterflies mate. So sometime in early to mid-September. They hatch and the larvae go into a dormancy and they don't come out until oh, late spring and and that's when they start, oh, I'm sorry, no, yes. They come out in early spring. In late spring, they pupate and they're in their little chrysalis for about two weeks before they hatch. Does that answer and the then, question? <laughs> and then um, how do they, are they able to know how many butterflies are successful to make it across 101? Like do the butterflies come back to that spot at any time how some animals do? Um, or how do they determine the success? Um, they're actually in the field catching butterflies. Um, and, and they, as I say, they mark them so they know which ones are wild hatched and which are hatched from uh, the, the zoo hatched. Um, so they can count them on the east side of the highway where they okay. are. And, I don't know if they count them on the way when they go back across. Of course, only the females go back. Um, oh. the, the males are really beaten up. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they fight for mates. And I remember talking to Ann Walker at US Fish and Wildlife, um, who was in charge of the butterfly program when I was doing the research. And she said, um, they're wild animals. And I was like, what, butterflies? Like, <laughs> they're wild animals. 
and they fight for their mates and um, they're pretty bruised and battered by the end of this of uh, the mating season and I, I assume wow. they die on that side of the, the road. Nobody ever talks about the poor, poor little male butterflies. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the, the females go back across and I don't, nobody has said anything about counting them when they're over there laying their okay. eggs. They would think maybe they don't want to bother them because right eggs. Right. And do you know if there are before and after studies of population being conducted on the butterflies and the salmon with the river restoration? Um, I don't. In, I don't think the river restoration has much to do with the butterfly population. Okay. Um, I don't know how much they've done yet on the on the fish counts. There are fish counts all up and down the coast um, to to see. Usually to see how many smolt are coming out, they build these fish weirs, and the people from ODFW go in and count the, the little baby salmon um, before they go out into the ocean. Um, there's also been some um, scuba diving, crawling around in the bottom of the river, uh, <laughs> see, <laughs> in wetsuits. Um, I don't know how, I don't know if they've done that at Big Creek yet. Okay. The project is new, this is its first year. in process, okay. Um, and then we have, uh, that was really incredible. So many great new ideas to think about. Thank you. Are there places where we can read about the butterfly hatches each year? Ooh, that's very interesting. I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I mean, people have been doing um, articles and news reports that um, the PBS nature guy, I can't remember what the name of the program is, um, but he goes out and he, he's done a couple on the silver spot wandering around with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife personnel and um, the dog thing and all the rest of it. Um, but I don't know if there's an actual report um, if U.S. Fish and Wildlife puts something out or not. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife would be the agency to yeah. kind of look at yeah. and connect with for that. Yeah, because this is a federal program. It's, it's under the Endangered Species Act, which is a federal program. It's got a lot of partners, local state partners, but um, they're the ones who are kind of in charge of it. And even with this project taking place in the Big Creek area, are there still opportunity for recreation? Yes, for but it's somewhat limited. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, there's a place to park on the north side of the, of the Big Creek Road. Um, you can run across the highway then being very careful. And, and to the beach. Um, there are also other places to park to get on the beach. But you can also go walk towards the bridge and then walk down Big Creek Road, or you can drive down Big Creek Road. There are a couple of good pullouts. And then you can you can just walk around. I mean, there's not much traffic on it. And so it's it's a nice hike. I go there with my dog quite often. Um, you can do so you can do that. There also, um, as you walk along the road to the left on the north side, um, and you can also access this from that little parking area there's a trail that kind of goes up onto the north side of the property. Um, it's not much of a trail, it's, it's, just, it's just there, but you can wander around and kind of look around. You can't get down onto the floodplain very well. There's some, um, the elk have made trails down, but it's pretty wet, so I don't know that you wanna walk there. But to the north of the gravel pit, <clears throat> um, there, I think it was a homestead site and you can walk there and you can walk down to the river and you can fish. And um, you often will see fishermen walking along there. And it's just really pretty. Um, it, you know, in the spring, there's just water, water, water everywhere. And the sunlight comes in in a really interesting way. It's, um, it's very mossy and, <clears throat> and very um, covered with moss and kind of gnarly. And so it's, yeah. it's a good photography place. Um, there's not much in the way of like kayaking or boating on the river. I don't think that's practical, but certainly fishing. You were right earlier when you said it would be totally different environment if a big resort had been built. You, I've, I hear so many comments from visitors or people we uh, had to fill out a survey that the area is so wild and that's something that they love about it and it's what keeps them coming back um, in, are these I, I open agree. nature areas, yeah. Well, and the National Forest is, um, I think it's designated roadless to the east of Big Creek and back in that area. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, 
It is. It's it, I, to me, even if I don't access it and actually walk through it, it just knowing it's there is very important. To yes. me. There's no lights at night. You know, it's that it's very dark and it's peaceful. Dark and skies are beautiful. Wild yeah. kind of way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's totally. Yeah. yeah. There are people who live up Big Creek Road. Oh, I forgot one thing I just would like to add. Yeah. Asking what effect did this have on land use planning, since I mentioned that in the title of the book. So I'm asking, answering that question. Um, when the uh, when the fir first hearing happened um, on the zone change, uh, the West Lane Planning Commission turned it down unanimously. And the activists along the area thought, well, phew, thank goodness we're done with that. But the developer appealed to the county commissioners. There were three of them at the time. And they, I mean, he'd met with them before, of course. And they, they overrode the local planning commission. And he had his permit. So the local activists were outraged because they didn't get notification of this appeal. And because none of them had property adjacent to, which was the way the hearings worked. You had to be adjacent to the property in question. Mm. And filed a, um, a complaint with LUBA, the Land Use Board of Appeals. This was all pretty new because the land use laws were had only been passed in 1973 and Lane County didn't have its uh, comprehensive plan done yet. So they appealed, they lost the appeal at LUBA, they appealed to the appellate court, they lost that appeal, but their pro bono lawyer, a man named Tim Circum, who actually became an appellate judge eventually, took it on up to the state Supreme Court and the Supreme Court overturned it on procedural grounds and said that if you had an interest in this decision, if you um, were a concerned citizen, if you had attended a hearing, if you wrote letters, then you had standing and you needed to be notified and you, needed, you, you were allowed to participate and you were allowed to file objections and all of that. So it was in, tremendously important because it, it opened the whole process up to people um, who, who didn't just have a property interest, they had interests in the habitat, in the ecosystem, in specific animals, and uh, it made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Kudos. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to them. I mean, I was all I did was write the book. So <laughs> I think it's Do important you, for people to know this. You know? Absolutely. Do you know who is maintaining or improving the vegetation at the restoration site? Um, they get uh, this person says, I get after not lead upstream, disturbance is necessary for restoring and following follow up crucial to get good natives going. I'm not, could you explain it just a little? I'm not quite sure. I yeah, so the question is, do you know who is maintaining or improving the vegetation at the restoration site? So would that be uh, the Midcoast Watershed? I, it's a partnership again. Um, one of the things they did in, in putting all that woody debris in and and restoring the floodplain was to try and get rid of the Japanese knotweed, which has infested the probably. It's very hard to get rid of because it's right next to streams. You can't put herbicides in there. Um, and it just spreads like crazy. So I, there is restoration um, um, efforts to keep that down. And I, I don't know if they're planting anything right along the river, but um, It's probably Mid Coast Watershed Council, but I would guess that ODFW, the uh, Fish and Wildlife, and probably a number of other partners and maybe volunteers are also working there. Yeah. And then we've just got some kudos. What a great story. Thank you so much. Can't wait to ride your book. Um, Thank you. And uh, a, a piggyback here Is there a place that your book can be bought in Portland? And what has been the interest in your book? Uh, well, I had 500 copies printed, and I think I have two boxes left, which is about 50 copies. Um, occasionally, I get um, requests for copies from out of state, but it's, it seems to be pretty local, which is too bad because I think the message, even though it involves a local project, um, the message is stick with it. It's important and be persistent. And I, I think that applies to people everywhere. So I, I have a Spanish teacher and she uh, lives in Mexico and she said, has it been translated into Spanish yet? <laughs> well, that would be nice. <laughs> you can do it. So I don't know, maybe I will. Yeah. As far as um, Portland, it, it is this, I, this was self-published, meaning that I went to an independent press and had it published. And that means you don't have any of the distribution facilities that 
books published by major publishing companies have. So it's, and the, the big uh, companies, Powell's and other bookstores don't really want to deal with it because they've got warehouses of books and they can make a phone call and the books show up in their store and otherwise they're dealing with me. And so it hasn't, there was a bookstore in Portland that, that had it and they, you know, they sold a copy or two. And then of course COVID happened and nothing much has happened. Um, it's available on Amazon as a, um, a Kindle book and you can just Google it and find it. Um, it. Again, if you contact me on my website, you can buy it with um, using PayPal and then I'll just mail it to you. You get a signed copy. Um, you can contact me at my Gmail. And I plugged those um, in the little, chat, yeah, good, as well good. for folks to kind of copy and paste. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, a couple times. So that will be here for everybody if you'd like it. Um, and then do you know if Salt Springs Creek flows into Big Creek? Is there a trail to the west? Salt Spring Creek? Yeah, that's what I this don't even, I don't I've even know that creek. It. Yeah, I've not heard of it either. So we don't mm. know. We don't know. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know most of the major tributaries along there. Um, but I, okay. Salt Spring. And then here's a nice reminder um, that was shared about, you know, how we should all clean our shoes um, before <laughs> and after visiting the, the, this area, but really a lot of different areas um, to prevent, help prevent in passing on invasive plants. So that's a good little reminder. Um, that's a good one. This. Yeah. So um, that is all for questions. And so Andrea, I just want to thank you again so much for being here with us this Saturday morning. Really great presentation. I know there's a lot of interest in this sweet little butterfly. Um, and I'm really curious to follow the progress of it and um, watch the Me success, too. hopefully, um, or learnings around it. So with that, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Andrea, thank you so much again, and hope to see you at a future presentation. I hope so too. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Bye. For bye. Bye. -bye.